All right, everybody, I just started the recording. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, my name is Anna Hansen. I'm the sales director here at ByteSpeed, and I'm going to moderate our virtual roundtable today. I'm super excited about the people that are here joining us, um, and I'll just give them each a moment to introduce themselves. Uh, Lucas, you want to go first? Yeah, I'm Lucas Holney. I'm the CTO at ByteSpeed, and uh, with AppStream, I'm kind of our um, technical lead, so I do a lot of the the onboarding of clients, a lot of work with our team internally here on uh, keeping everything running and maintained and um, and yeah, obviously work a lot with Anna's team on uh, calls and things like that as well, so. Thanks, Lucas. Kyle, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Kyle Dibble. I'm Director of Technology for Logan Sport Community School Corporation, Indiana. We're called corporations and not districts, but uh, so I've uh, been here since November of 09 and been working with Byte Speed for several years and, um, uh, and specifically the past uh, year and a half or so with Lucas uh, working on this Amazon uh, web streaming and uh, they've been uh, really good to work with. So I'm excited to be here and help answer any questions. Thanks, Kyle. Joe? Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Joe Wakeman. I'm the Director of Technology and Communications for the Nevada Community School District in Central Iowa. Um, we have been doing app stream for, I think the better part of three going on four years now, um, had done some other app virtualization prior to that, but yeah, been app stream for a while now and loving it. Thank you, Joe. I am. Um, so the, the platform I'm going to have, I'm looking for as much interaction from you guys as we can get. So if you pop any questions you have, there's two options. You can put them into the Q and A, or you can put them into the chat, whichever is easiest for you. And I'll ask the panel the questions as they get going. Um, I've got a couple that people submitted to me a little earlier that I can, that I'll kind of throw pepper in there as well. But Lucas, for people that are a little bit newer to AppStream, do you want to just kind of give them a basic overview of what AppStream can do? Yeah, um, I'll say from a, just like a 10,000 foot level, um, it's more of application virtualization. So it's really going to excel at um, taking applications that run in Windows and pushing them into the cloud and letting you deploy those applications to uh, any device that has a web browser. Um, it can be a Chromebook, it can be a Mac, it can be an iPad, it can be another Windows device. Um, in a nutshell though, it allows you to uh, take applications, push them in the cloud, stream them to the devices, and of course, the higher end applications that Chromebooks can't run um, without a Windows backbone. So you're looking at Adobe Creative Cloud, um, Autodesk, which is Revit and um, Inventor, things like that, Auto, AutoCAD. And um, Project Lead the Way. So a lot of CTE cur curriculum only runs on Windows. And it's a good way for you to um, get those applications running on your Chromebooks and then also solving the issue of um, access to the apps too. So you don't have to be in a computer lab in the school at a specific time. You can do it uh, from anywhere at any time, um, just depending on how you have it set up. So that's perfect. Okay, so this first question is for Joe and Kyle, and that's um, VDI solutions are not new. Um, assuming you guys may have looked at some other solutions in the past, can you tell us why you picked AppStream and a little bit about your experience with any of the other solutions? Um, Joe, I'll have you go first. Yeah, so um, we had started down the app virtualization process the better part of six years ago. Um, we had looked at a few different things at that point. Um, AppStream wasn't really a, 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 I don't even know if it existed, but it certainly wasn't a big player at that time. Um, we looked at a few different things. I, I've got a pretty robust um, VMware environment for our servers. So we thought, well, VMware has got an option. Um, and we ended up with an um, uh, in-house Citrix uh, environment for app virtualization, mainly because it, it, it had a few better features for um, as far as Chromebook interaction went. Um, so we were uh, Citrix Farm internally, so we bought some really expensive servers with graphics cards in them. Um, prior to that point, we didn't have any centralized Active Directory or anything. It, we did, but it, it wasn't student facing, um, being an all Mac school. So we didn't, we leveraged that for some internal 
stuff, but not for everybody. So we had to spin up a, a pretty substantial environment for um, Active Directory for students to support that. So a pretty robust backend infrastructure and pretty high cost um, initially to get all that set up and going. Worked pretty well um, for those couple of years and then um, kind of to start to hear a little bit more and more about AppStream and, and compared it to with what we had with Citrix because after I invested in all that hardware, my, my support cost was X. It wasn't necessarily that huge amount. So we don't need to move away from Citrix, but let's take a look at this app stream, see what it's all about. Um, and between basically paying for the same amount that we were gonna pay for support with Citrix was what my, is what my app stream cost is. Um, it, I don't have that initial investment, so I don't have to, next time my servers age out, that I don't need to buy that super expensive hardware again. Um, support, it's a little bit quicker and easier for me to be able to spin things up and down as needed. I, I, I'm not, I don't have a hardware limit to things now. So say I needed to spin up 500 of these things um, for AppStream to support 500 kids. I, it's not like I need to go hurry up and go purchase more hardware for it. It's all there. So. That's kind of where we were at and how we made that transition to AppStream. Awesome. Kyle, will you tell us about yours? Sure. Um, so we were looking for, we have a career center here at, uh, uh, at our corporation. And one of the things we were looking for is that remote solution. Um, also, um, hardware, you know, upgrades, you know, refreshing those uh, labs every year and everything. It just takes time, imaging trying to get all that built up uh, every summer. And then obviously COVID hit and our kids are working remote and needed a solution. And I was familiar with more of the, you know, remote desktop services, kind of, you know, the Citrix, the stuff that Citrix runs on top of uh, from a um, previous uh, job as at a reseller, putting those ins uh, installations in other companies, especially factories or hospitals using that technology. So we started looking at that in some of the areas that I looked at or other companies that I looked at, they, they weren't in tune with education. The pricing for when I was looking at it was it would be a lot more than us replacing hardware every five years, uh, let alone trying to build up the server farm to support what we needed. So with our career in tech ed, we have, you know, we have AutoCAD going on, we have you know people on Illustrator going on, we have people with Inventor and, and going on, Photoshop. So there's multiple students on at one time. And so the cost that for us to take that direct hit and do it ourselves was just uh, way too much. And that was one of the things that come along with ByteSpeed is they, they got it and they uh, came up with pricing that was affordable for us in uh, the education market. So we, last fall of 19 or 20, when all this started, we uh, uh, went on with uh, AppStream and, and Amazon. And the nice thing too was we were looking for, all of our students are on Chromebooks. So the integration with Google Drive was very important. And our students were working uh, on Chromebooks from home, turning in homework over Google Drive. So it uh, made a very seamless transition for us to bring the classroom to the students at home. And we continue using it. And uh, as we look forward at our model, we had a couple of years left on our current um, desktops before we refreshed. But uh, I know working with the team there by speed, we're looking at making this move, this transition to be not at refreshing that hardware and, and um, just continue using uh, the app stream because it's working so well and it's available to the kids, you know, 24 seven if you want it. But there is a cost to that. I'm sure Lucas can go into more detail, but you know, why you don't have everything spun up all the time because there's somebody still gonna pay for those cycles and those CPU uh, cycles running, so. Um, can you, one other thing I would just say, like integrating new technologies with teachers is sometimes more difficult even than addressing the new technologies with students. Do you guys have any um, anything that you did to help make things more successful with integration across the teachers and the student environment? And you could share, do you wanna, Joe, would you answer that one? And then we'll do Kyle next. Yeah, so, um... And we were kind of in the same boat as Kyle that a lot of CTE focused things, especially um, your project lead the ways, your graphic designs, that sort of thing. Um, so we we put the software on our image and then worked with the teacher to find out, okay, how does this work 
is this going to be a sufficient environment? Is this going to do what you would expect it to do? And that's where we kind of some some things that we thought we understood as the IT department had to shift a little bit. And then what they expected as a teacher from the endpoint delivering the, the software needed to shift a little bit. Um, but once some of those kind of ingrained thoughts shifted, um, it definitely was a more successful rollout. Um, kind of as Kyle mentioned as well, it, it, you look at the numbers, I can spend $50,000 to replace a CAD lab, or I can spend this much on AppStream and we can stretch our dollar a lot farther and try and bolster your program in other ways as well. Um, so that was a, a pretty big selling point. Um, and it, like our teacher, he actually, um, our teacher that started last year, he doesn't even have a PC for Project Lead the way he's got a normal issued Mac like every other teacher in the district and he runs AppStream just like the kids do um, from his side as the teacher. So he's, he's using it and living it every day. Um, kind of walking that walk and um, he knows no different, so. That's great. Um, what about you, Kyle? Any advice or input on integrating with the teacher and student experience? Sure, we, uh, first thing we did, we just went, you know, with one teacher uh, just to figure out that it was uh, a little bit more, you know, kind of comfortable with technology and changes. Um, and we worked with her to uh, kind of roll it out at first, figure out, you know, what's missing, you know, what are we not getting right or bugs uh, through that process and uh, just kind of figured out what her needs, what she wanted for the class. And then we just started with her and then we opened it up to the rest of the teachers once we kind of had a game plan together of how to roll it out to everybody else. So it made it pretty smooth to spin up the other teachers and get them going. Um, so um, it, it's actually, once they just kind of grab the concept of I'm going to this browser now to launch this, and oh, here's my Google Drive. I'm connected. It's once they it, they're they're in that environment, right? They're already in Photoshop or Inventor or whatever. So it's not you know to them, that's just a new way of getting to it instead of launching an icon off of a desktop, for instance. We're just launching it out of a browser now. So it wasn't. And it, it just takes that a, just little my. It takes that little bit of mind shift, change mm -hmm. mindset change that I'm I'm running it where. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, realistically, our kids and teachers think they are running Inventor on a Chromebook. They don't know that it's running out here in the cloud. They think it's running here on the Chromebook. So it, it, just different funny conversations and things with kids that, that yeah. oh, or, you know, other schools will get emails. Oh, we heard you got Photoshop to run in your Chromebooks. How are you doing that? Well, it's not technically running on the Chromebook. It's <laughs> AppStream. Right. Um, but so a little bit of a shift there. Um, one thing we did that helped adoption as well is uh, this year we purchased um, some 22 inch widescreen monitors for our um, CAD classroom. And then I bought a USB-C dock station. So they've got a keyboard mouse monitor in the dock. So when the kid brings their normal issued Chromebook, they set it down, they can plug it in and now they've got their peripherals and a large screen that they can do some of that stuff. Exact on. direction we're gonna go. Um, yep. So that we had done for several years prior, um, doing it just on the smaller screen. Um, but then with uh, that teacher retiring and a new teacher coming in, he thought the kids would be a little bit more efficient um, doing that. So, okay, you know, a couple hundred bucks a pop I, in that that's not necessarily going to age out like a PC would. Um, I, I think that was a pretty easy compromise for us to make. And, mm -hmm. and the kids are able to do, I, I, after watching them, I think they can operate a little bit more successfully. Um, with some of the software doing that now, like our graphic design kids um, that are using Photoshop, they're perfectly content doing it on their normal screen, um, the 11.6 inch screen. Um, I don't but know again, how. that was, <laughs> I don't yeah, know how, but yeah. And, and, well, and a lot of it is, and a lot, well, that's exactly it. A lot of it is the teacher says there's no way I could do it on a smaller screen, but the kids are so used to these smaller screens, whether it be a tablet, oh, yeah. a Nintendo switch, a phone, a whatever that, yeah, that's no big deal. As long as I get decent resolution on my Chromebook, it's not a big deal. Um, so a lot of times some of those conversations are just a little bit of let the teacher, okay, let's, let's try it with the kids and actually see, see how this goes. Um, if it fails, okay, let's look at adapting here a little bit, but um, definitely, I think through the process, you need to be flexible and understanding that you're trying to give something new and totally understood, 
ununderstood to kids and teachers that know nothing about app virtualization or, you know, they don't need to, and they don't necessarily need to need to know how it works either. Just here, I'm going to do this so you can run Inventor on your Chromebook and I'll worry about the details. You tell me if it works or not. So that's kind of the approach that we've taken to not, not gloss everybody over with the details and, and don't look at the man behind the curtain kind of thing. But right. <laughs> right. I love that. Hey, Lucas, there's a couple of questions in the chat that I would kind of direct in your direction, but then I would say Kyle and Joe, if you guys can like chime in on any personal experience that you have in there. Um, I don't know if you want to maybe talk about the applications that we have included and then also just address the print question as well. Yeah, which I'm I've sure been trying you guys to both have. answer some of the questions as they've been coming through. Um, and right, so the, the applications that are gonna run in AppStream are gonna be, uh, you are gonna have to do a little bit of research if it's kind of a customized thing. So there's things that work well and there's some things that don't work that well. Um, it works really well if it's a CPU or graphics intensive program. Um, and it, it's not gonna work very well if it requires a lot of disk read and write because um, we're basically using cloud storage throughout um, the entirety of AppStream when you're using it. So it's um, OneDrive, Google Drive, and even if you don't use that, if you attach other storage, it's still cloud-based. Um, so programs like Unity, uh, Unreal Engine, those big project graphic-based applications aren't going to work very well. Um, but on the flip side, like the the applications that do work well that we offer in a per user pricing is going to be the Adobe Creative Suite, um, Autodesk, um, the Project Lead the Way applications, which we can probably drop a link to the chat in um, if you're a PLTW school. Um, and then outside of that, um, as long as the application runs on a server 2019 um, operating system, it should work in AppStream. Um, I've run across some applications that don't work in server and it's just the way that the program or the software was written just isn't going to be compatible. Um, but for the most part, there's not a lot I've come across um, besides just those heavy uh, disk uh, read and write uh, applications. So um, then on the printing side, uh, it's not directly connected to your network. So AppStream inherently lives in the cloud and it's not going to be tied to anything on premise unless you want it to be. You have to uh, manually set up a, a VPN connection between the two. Um, so being as it's running in the browser, uh, there's no um, direct printing or USB pass-through options. Um, there's other there's solutions out there that I, I haven't um, had a lot of experience with, but there's USB over IP options. Um, I think anywhere USB is one of them. And again, if you look at Project Lead the Way's resources, it, it'll it kind of talk about that a little bit because they, they do have applications that require USB connected devices like heart rate monitors and um, you know different things that log um, activities in software and app stream. So, um, Joe so that, or yeah. Kyle, do you guys have anything? Sorry, Lucas, do you guys have anything on the print side? Have you either of you addressed a print question or did you just know you can't do it? For us, uh, like in our um, Inventor and AutoCAD lab, since everything, the students are saving things to Google Drive, uh, the teachers that have the device there, they can pull it up. But so much of it now, they just grade by pulling it up in AppStream and, uh, or on their device, uh, their Windows device and in their as a teacher and grade it that way. So there's actually a lot less printing, but for the things that they do need to print, the teacher will pull it up and print it currently because uh, most of the work that the students are doing, they're just turning it into in a folder on a Google Drive to get graded. And there hasn't been a, you know, there's not a big need for printing. So that has not come up a lot. And like I said, if they need to print out um, for like uh, over on our Photoshop lab, uh, she'll just print things out for the students. Uh, as needed, which actually has cut way back on wasted paper for us. And I did see somebody uh, put something in the chat about paper cut cloud print that they were trying to get it to work. We started looking at, we do paper cut and we're kind of looking at, you know, possibility if, if there's a way to install the driver mobility print in the app stream, but we haven't crossed that yet with uh, Lucas or anything to see 
about trying that way. But um, I do know with PaperCut, you can upload a file to an, by a, a web browser and try to print, but we've not attempted any of that. But that's a good point. It could be a good thing to try. You yeah, haven't come across that one yet, so I'll have to dig into it. Anything on your end, Joe, or are you just saying go online and run it that way? From yeah, that's we leverage uh, Google Drive integration really heavily here, um, and drop folders are kind of our solution to. Nobody's actually has to print, so it's not something I've had to address. But I think that drop folder functionality is is fitting the bill where. Like our project lead the way teacher, he'll create a shared drive um, called teacher drop period one. And then the kids save their their finished projects to their or things they need to share with the teacher there. Um, and then he can access them through his Mac natively um, through Google Drive. So that's kind of been our nobody's asked, but that would I would assume would be the the best solution for us. Um, there was a message about scheduling and the boot up time in the in the chat there. And I'll just, I know for us, um, we've worked really hard to get things scheduled so that people don't have a bad experience if they have to wait a long time for things to spin up. So a lot of that is just knowing what how many seats to have available, getting it scheduled, making sure that we have the schedule set up in advance. Um, Lucas, do you want to talk about the two different options that we have available as far as our, our pricing plans? We've got a Sure. per user yeah so so right there's there's two different levels kind of based off of the two different common usage scenarios we see in education so uh the first one is going to be um a predictable economy so that's going to be basically um or supplement sorry supplemental economy if i'm saying it right <laughs> um basically if you just have it uh upstream there for supplemental usage you have um basically a static capacity throughout the day for AppStream to account for students who couldn't make it into class that are on home quarantine, uh, homework, that kind of things throughout the day. It's just available for those students to hop on and use as, as they need it. Um, and then with the uh, performance plan, the scalable performance, uh, that is more designed as a lab replacement. So if you have a 10 a.m. class with 25 students that are gonna use Photoshop, whatever it is, will scale the capacity to meet the demand for that class. So you might have multiple classes throughout the day. You might just have one or two. You might um, have uh, full one through eight periods of classes. You know, we'll, we'll make sure the capacity matches what you would need for the um, usage and, um, and then available for homework and after hour use as well, so. That's awesome. And I'll, um, I'll have to also talk uh, just to help with that. Lucas was really good about early on um, helping, you know, kind of balance that out, what that looks like. But also, they've created a portal. Bytespeed has, has a portal um, that allows you to go in and kind of see where your peak times are and who your heavy users are. So it really kind of helps work with them and kind of balance out how you want to have uh, availability. So those times like in the evenings, certain times. So you don't have that. And somebody put earlier in the chat, you know, a 20 minute wait time, you can kind of control when that happens. Um, so ours are more spun up in the evening right now during the day, since we do have lab computers, instead of burning, you know, going through our hours at the moment till we switch over um, to our um, user based, um, but uh, it's just to help with uh, managing that. So that they're encouraged more to use the PCs. And then as we make our transition here, um, we'll uh, you know, make that different uh, for spin up based on class loads and times and everything. So there is ways to kind of figure that out pretty quickly and balance it out. A question for, for you, Joe and Kyle is like, what if you if you're at the beginning of the process that like so many people on this webinar right now, um, what are some things that you'd want to keep in mind or that you wish you'd known when you were getting started about how you were implementing what you started with the classroom deployment, just conversations that you wish you might've had that maybe you didn't, um, that would be good advice for anybody that's just getting started right now. I think for us, um, I tried to go into it knowing the best I could what our usage patterns would be, um, but also know there's gonna be a lot of variability to that, that you know, sick kids um, 
here in Iowa, we've got snow, so snow days or snow delays where the schedule's all messed up. So if I had things kind of tiered at certain times um, as far as when things were available, well, I, I couldn't micromanage that to a degree that I wanted to just because I couldn't be super responsive to be able to adapt to those pop changes. Um, and then I think the other thing is um, be flexible that it's you're doing something that these teachers and kids haven't done before so while we can make the tech work um just make sure that you're you're working one and one with your teachers um that you want this to succeed with because if you just dump this on them and say hey here you go um any little thing that that they see is a detriment to this versus a full-on lab is just going to taint the solution from the get-go so really work strongly with with those folks that that are going to use the solution so that way you can ensure that they're having a great experience or that any issues they perceive that you can take care of one way or another because um, that's the last thing i want to do is be an impediment to classwork um, but at the same time i don't want to turn around and walk away from this and now have to go buy lab machines again that i have to maintain and and kind of go down that direction. So anything I can do to make the solution successful and have our staff and students successful, it just, that'd be a pretty strong suggestion. Thanks, Joe. What about you, Kaya? Um, same thing. It's it's really about kind of using consultative uh, approaches that kind of requirements analysis, if you will, is just sitting out the teachers and finding out, you know, what are their expectations? So, because they were, you know, demanding that, hey, we need to have a way for these kids, these students to work from home. Uh, and even prior to this, they wanted a way for them to work on homework uh, in the evenings or on e-learning days and just kind of what that expectation and there were, you know, a little bit of a shift. And I said, well, that's how we, that's why we started with one teacher and kind of get that champion and getting it to work and, and working. She had a smaller set of students we started with. So we were able to kind of figure all those, um, hiccups, you know, those, those challenges we're going to run into and get those ironed out and be able to communicate that then to the rest of the teachers. And really, that was where it was at, was getting the teachers kind of comfortable with it. Students, we just pointed them in the direction, showed them how to log into their Google Drive, and they were, they were good. They were ready to go. So we really didn't, wasn't much there. It was just fundamentally shifting, you know, the mindset of the teacher kind of where this is at. And, oh, I'm going to Google Drive instead of this NAS device to get the files and all that. And kind of teaching them a little bit more about Google Drive permissions. So that's kind of, that. it's just setting those realistic expectations and kind of what they are expecting to get out of it. We've got a few more minutes. There's a question in the chat and I do, I am going to address, I'll answer it to, the, to my knowledge. Um, and then I'm curious to how you guys are funding this too. One of the questions was, can we use the new USAC uh, ECF funding? Um, since it can be used for remote learning, and if so, are any recommendations on how to word that? Um, unfortunately, it is not a ECF qualifying expense. Um, however, it is very, very CARES and Azure funding qualifiable. So if you have any money available there, um, Joe or Kyle, do you guys want to talk about how you guys funded it in the district? Was it a typical tech budget or did you leverage any of the COVID funds? Our, our career center, he uh, was able to get through some grants. So uh, we, at the time, we didn't have to um, use any of our gear or ESSER funds for this. Uh, the career center, he had some grants available to uh, purchase this to get us started. What about you, Joe? And as far as us, we've been doing it for a long time. Um, our usage didn't change at all because of COVID, just because we had had it prior. Um, so. We're just using technology department funds. Um, kind of the thing that I explain to people is look at where your source of those computers for those programs, where did that money come from? Whether it was a tech budget, a curriculum budget, a CTE budget, whatever, look where the funding for those machines came from. And to me, that's a logical replacement for, okay, I'm just shifting instead of me buying hardware, I'm just buying software now um for the same thing so that's that's what we've done and what i've kind of recommended to people outside of covid funding anyways i would be curious joe do you uh, uh i know in the state of indiana like chromebooks they're considered a book uh or laptop devices so we can you know charge part of that as a fee like a book fee 
uh, I was curious uh, where you're at, or do you guys charge a technology fee to try to help cover any of the costs? So we do, and we look at it as a textbook replacement fee. Um, and we use that for a lot of our subscriptions um, to things like WeVideo and things like that. I could see this as a very logical avenue for that as well. All right. One last question, and then I think we'll we'll call it. And anyone that has any follow-ups, please don't hesitate to reach out and um I'd be happy to get an answer if I don't happen to have one. The last one is, do the Chromebooks that run this have a specific base requirements? Oh. And I'll just say that um, you just need a web browser. So all of the processing, all of everything that's happening is happening in the cloud. So you guys have anything? That's the, pretty, cool, crazy? That's the pretty cool thing is that it, I mean, we've done it on Raspberry Pis. Um, one of our um, Project Lead the Way teachers, we had some Raspberry Pi stations for Citrix. And that was when we started the transition over, we took the Citrix thin client off of those Raspberry Pis and then just ran Chrome in a web browser. I mean, it, it, it'll run on my Android phone. You need a modern web browser and that's about it. That's awesome. I'm gonna drop a web page into, um, into the chat here. And it just is, we've done the best that we could to think of all the questions that we get asked pretty commonly and throw them, um, throw them up onto our website. The, Pricing is public. Everything's listed on that website, but we're always happy to jump on a phone call if anybody has any specific questions. And um, we thank you, I, Kyle and Joe. We've quick, done these I guys quite a lot this. throughout this deployment. <laughs> See, that's all right. Hey, uh, so the, there was a question about do the Chromebooks that run uh, have specific base uh, requirements? And we started running it originally on um, four-year-old Chromebooks. Uh, so uh, to whatever those specs of 2000, so 20, so about 2017 or 18 spec Chromebooks, and they it ran fine. And, and well, just as Joe, Joe said, they ran them on a Raspberry Pi. So you can see that the requirements are very, very uh, low that needed to do this. So but, uh, I think your, you know, your screen is going to be a refresh for that is going to be kind of that. And, um, and no, I know none of us are running it, uh, this hosting from this. I just... I told people I'm running this from a newer Chromebook that I'm testing out. So I'm on here. So that's why I think it's kind of odd. My resolution is just low on this one, but I don't ECF think anybody funding does hosting. cover Chromebooks though. Yes, they do. Um, I, I think we probably in the essence of time want to wrap this up pretty quick, but Miguel just to answer most districts on prem are hosted. Um, this is, it's all, um, off-prem, but most of the schools that we're working with are hosted. Lots, there are schools all over the country that are running AppStream without any um, managed service. It is very, very doable, but you have to dedicate some time and resources to it and be willing to commit to a learning curve. Um, when I first learned about this solution, I thought, well, gosh, we don't need to do anything here because everybody can just go put it together themselves. And then I was educated very quickly that it's not it's not that easy. Um, there's a lot of time and resources that get put together, um, building out your images, maintaining your images, setting up schedules and fleets. And um, so that's the value add that, that we provide at ByteSpeed is to we manage the environment and build out the fleets and schedule and make it easy so you don't have to worry about those things. So happy to talk through either way and be a resource no matter what anybody decides though. Thank you guys so much for coming on, Lucas and Kyle and Joe. You guys are the best. We really appreciate you and um, happy to jump on a follow up call with anybody that has any follow up questions. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.